Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a telephone conversation between a male insurance agent and a female client who wants to make changes to her policy. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Tauber Insurance Company. How can I help you? Good morning. I want to alter my insurance policy. Is that for your house, contents, or vehicle? My vehicle. Can you give me the number of the policy, please? Certainly, I have it here in front of me. It's ZQW five o o nine. And what make and model of car is it? It's a Mazda, a Mazda Marvel. And what's the CC rating? Sorry, what do you mean? How big is the engine? Is it one thousand five hundred or one thousand eight hundred CC, for example? Oh, that! It's actually much bigger than that. It's two thousand five hundred cc. Thank you. Now I just have to ask you a few questions to verify your identity. What name is the policy under? Heathcote. Let me just bring that up on the computer. Yes. Can I just confirm your first name, please? Well, my first name is Lisa, but I'm known by my middle name, Marie. Right. I see both here, but Lisa is the one I want for ID purposes. And your date of birth, Lisa? I mean, Marie. The twenty-second of August, nineteen fifty-five. Correct. Just one more question before we get started. Can you remember the password on this policy? Oh dear, I didn't know I had a password on it. Everyone has a password. Would you like to take a guess? Possibly, it's my mother's name. And what would that be? Sophia. Sorry, guess again. All right. Oh, I remember now. It's my grandfather's name, Jack. Yes, followed by some numbers. One eight nine seven, right? Correct. Now we can get down to business. What exactly do you want to change? Well, a couple of things. Firstly, I think it's overvalued at the moment. Can we reduce the value by five thousand dollars? You mean bring it down to fifteen thousand dollars? Yes, I'm sure it's lost quite a bit of value over the past year. Done. Now, what's the other thing? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Well, I want to add the name of another driver to my insurance policy. Who is it? His name is Samuel Michaels. He doesn't have the same family name as you. No, he doesn't. Is that a problem? No, it shouldn't be, as long as he's over the age of twenty-five. But we find it easier to get approval for family members. Oh, his family. He's married to my daughter. He's my son-in-law, and he's twenty-eight. In fact, good. And what would he be using the car for? Would it be business or social purposes? Not really. You see, I've injured my right arm, and I'm having difficulty driving. It's not an automatic. I have to use the gear stick. And Sam, that is Samuel, offered to drive me to my appointments and so on. He's a good driver, and I feel safe with him. But I'd like to know that the car is still insured with him behind the wheel. So that would be family reasons, then. Yes, I think so. Will my premium go up? No, 
as long as you can provide us with a photocopy of his driver's license, a true copy, you know what I mean. You'll have to get someone from the Department of Transport to sign it, saying that he's seen the original document. I think we can manage that without any difficulty. Oh, and while he's at the department, he should ask them for a record of any driving offences, demerit points, that kind of thing. Only for the last five years, though. We're not interested in anything beyond that, but it's important that he has a clean record for the five previous years. Oh, I'm sure that won't be a problem. Is there anything else you need? Just the date for when you'd like this to take effect. Today, if that's possible. Yes, we can issue temporary cover from today's date, but full cover won't apply until we've received the paperwork and it's been approved. What exactly is temporary? He'll be covered for two full weeks, but it will lapse after that time if there's any problem with his credentials. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a counsellor from health services talking about confidence and goal setting. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello, I'm Jo from Health Services, and I'm pleased to be here talking to you today. You've come here today to learn more about gaining confidence and setting goals. How many of you are truly positive thinkers? Positive thinking is the key to confidence. It doesn't matter whether you are playing a sports match facing an interview, or preparing for an exam. If you apply positive thinking, you will gain confidence. This is the secret. Positive thought patterns. Positivity leads to confidence, which, in turn, will optimise your performance. What is the one simple mental strategy that all confident people have in common? They concentrate on success. But don't they ever fail? Don't they make mistakes? What happens when things go wrong? The crucial difference is that they don't dwell on failure. Everybody makes mistakes. I mean, how else do we learn? Rather than giving up or becoming depressed, the best strategy is to register the mistake, note what went wrong, and determine what would have been a better way to act or what could have been done differently in order to achieve a more successful outcome. Then move on. Yes. Erase the negative emotions, allow those memories of defeat, frustration or dissatisfaction to fade and move forward. Negativity erodes confidence. You need to put aside your disappointments and focus on successful outcomes. Oh, it's not that easy, I can hear you saying. Well, no, it's not easy to forget failure, but no one ever fails completely. So congratulate yourself on the areas where you did do well. Mentally replay the best bits, even if they're only a small part. 
Now, there are two more things you need to do. Firstly, rehearsal. Yes, you heard me. Rehearsal. Surely only actors in a play need to rehearse their parts? No, the truth is, we all need to rehearse. This is a surefire way to build confidence. Before the match, presentation, the exam, or whatever, imagine yourself performing successfully in that particular situation. And here's the second tip look confident. That will always give you an extra physiological advantage. So, you can see that mind and body work together on this. You have to think and act positively. Let's talk a bit more about how to look confident. If you have to overcome a challenge, get rid of that anxious expression and rigid posture, those downcast eyes and nervous gestures. Even if you don't feel very self assured, you can still give the appearance of confidence. Stand tall, hold your head up, make full eye contact, and keep an open expression. Replace the frown with a smile if you can manage it. And those hunched shoulders? Relax those shoulder muscles. If you need to, take a deep breath and stretch to release pent up anxiety and tension. What if you have to make a difficult phone call, for example? Nobody can actually see you, so does it matter what you look like? Yes, it does. Practicing positive body language will help you cross the threshold into a confident mood. Before we move on to talk about goal setting, it may surprise you to know that once you have set a goal in life, the brain responds with a burst of activity, which we experience as, that's right, happiness. And what happens when the goal is achieved? Yes, there is another burst of activity and another feeling of happiness. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. As you can see, the recipe for a happy life is to maintain a positive attitude and keep setting and achieving your goals. So, whatever your goal, whatever it is that you're aiming for, a new job, losing weight, giving up smoking, graduation, you need an appropriate, and by appropriate I mean achievable goal. That's the first step. The next thing to consider is motivation. How do you get going? Well, it's more likely to motivate you if you think of the rewards of success rather than focus on failure or what you might lose. So, you need to establish your incentives. After that, you'll have to work out the various stages and phases that you'll need to go through along the way and prepare for each one of them. If you're not naturally motivated, keep the target small and achievable. But it really is important to ensure you collect the resources to accomplish the various steps. If you have performed that particular task before, you may already have the resources, or at least know where to get them from. If not, ask someone who has already succeeded. When you have got this far, the next stage is obvious. Yes. You have to take the first step. That's not quite all there is to it, though. The final thing is to remember to keep track of what you've accomplished. In other words, be sure to maintain a progress log. That way, you can look back at your previous small successes and watch your progress along the way to achieving your goal. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two.
Part 3 You will hear a conversation between two students and their professor, who is asking them to organise a panel discussion for an upcoming conference. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Come in and sit down, Louise, Stuart. I suppose you're wondering why I've asked you both to come here today. Well, we've heard rumours. Forget the rumours. I'll get straight down to business. You know that I'm organising a conference on 17th century English literature? Yes, but... Well, I've arranged for three keynote speakers, and I've invited 25 panellists so that we can have five panel discussions, and I want you two to organise one of the panel discussions. But we haven't done that before. Is it like a team presentation? No, the purpose is quite different. In a team presentation, the group presents agreed-upon views, as you have both done at the end of a group project. Yes. Well, in a panel discussion, the purpose is to put forward different views. We want to expose the audience to several different viewpoints at the same session. It can help the audience evaluate their own positions regarding specific issues, and if it's well conducted, it's usually more interesting than a single speaker forum. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. And what exactly do we have to do? Well, you'll take the role of leader or moderator and assistant. Is that like the role of chairman? Yes, that's it. Sounds daunting. Not at all. I've already done a great deal of the preparation myself. Let me run through the procedure with you. I've singled out an issue that will entail quite some conflict of opinion. I've selected panellists who are well-informed and will probably have contradictory points of view. That's very important, you know. Actually, I feel a bit nervous. How many panellists will there be? Well, I've invited five panellists for each panel, because that's probably the maximum number that an inexperienced moderator can handle. But don't worry, I always invite more than we need, because you can be sure someone won't be able to make it. So you'll probably just end up with four which is a very manageable number. Oh, I see. And I've chosen a moderator. That's you, by the way. Ah, but Stuart will help, right? Yes. I'll get on to timekeeping and whatnot shortly. That's where an assistant is indispensable. But what procedure do we follow to conduct the panel discussion? Don't worry. I was just about to say, I've also settled on the format. What is it? There are various formats that can be followed. But I've always found this one to be very effective. Yes? OK. Make some notes on these guidelines as I run through them, and ask me questions about anything you don't understand. We're ready. Firstly, the moderator introduces the topic and the panellists. But we don't know who the panellists are. Don't worry. I've prepared a short biographical introduction for each one of them, and I'll give you that information tomorrow. Oh, good. Next. The panellists are given a set amount of time to present their views on the topic. I'd say about two minutes each should be sufficient. Now, this is where Stuart's timekeeping is going to be important. You have to keep to the schedule all the way through, because the lecture room has only been booked for an hour. How do I indicate when the time is up? You stand off to one side of the panel, either with your back to the audience or hidden from the audience, but in full view of the panel and moderator. You have a digital clock or timer and you hold up the appropriate number of fingers to give the number of minutes. When the time is up, you make a cutting gesture with your hand. Ah, but what if the panellists keep talking? Then that's your job to politely intervene and move on to the next segment, which is the discussion itself. Panellists discuss, ask questions, and react to the opinions of other panel members. 
This, of course, is their primary function and should occupy about sixty percent of the allotted time. Stuart will watch the time, right? Yes, because you'll be making brief notes. Why? Well, when the time's up, the moderator shuts down the debate and provides a summary of the discussion. Oh, and then it's over. Well, no. The secondary function of the panel is to answer questions from the audience, and that should take up the remaining fifteen to twenty minutes. It's the leader's role to recognise appropriate questions and reject those not related to the subject. During the question period, you must maintain strict control, and this will most likely be the toughest part of the whole job. Oh dear! Stuart will of course help you here by ensuring that as many people as possible have a chance to ask their questions, and that no one member of the audience tries to dominate. With about five minutes to go, he'll announce that there's time for only a couple more questions, then announce. Last question, and then it's over. Not quite. You still have to acknowledge the involvement of the panelists and invite the audience to thank them with a round of applause. Should I clap too? Yes, you should both take part in the applause. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three. Part four. You will hear a talk on hydroelectric power. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Welcome to our series on renewable resources. The topic today is hydropower. As you most probably know, hydro means water, so we are talking about using water to generate electricity. Of course, there are many ways to generate electricity, but hydropower is important to the community. Firstly and obviously, because it's renewable. The Earth's hydrologic cycle of constant evaporation and transpiration provides a continual supply of water from rainfall and snowmelt. The second point to consider is its efficiency. Hydropower plants are able to convert approximately 90% of the energy from the falling water into electric energy, whereas many fossil-fueled plants lose more than half of the energy content of their fuel by way of waste heat and gases. For this reason, they are very efficient. Hydropower is also clean. It doesn't emit harmful gases that contribute to air pollution, acid rain, and global warming. No trucks, trains, or pipelines are needed to bring fuel to the site. And there's no noise pollution either. Furthermore, hydropower plant machinery is fairly simple and runs at slow speeds, which makes it reliable and durable. And hydropower units are flexible also. They have the ability to start quickly and adjust rapidly to changes in demand for electricity, thus enabling them to meet peak loads. But this also allows them to serve as reserve capacity and bring more stability to the power system overall. The dams that provide hydroelectric power also have other uses, such as navigation, flood damage reduction, water supply, recreation, irrigation, and low flow augmentation. But it's not the purpose of this talk to go into those details. How do the hydropower plants work? Well, a dam is built across a river, which captures water to form a reservoir and raises the water level to create head. Think of head as the vertical distance that the water falls as it passes through the dam. In other words, the difference in water level between the reservoir behind the dam and the river below. Water from the reservoir flows through an intake gate into a penstock. 
This is a kind of narrow channel which leads to the turbine below. The force of the water causes the turbine to rotate rapidly, which in turn drives the generator to spin and produce electricity. The electricity is carried the long distances from the powerhouse to substations on the outskirts of cities via power lines. Can you build a hydropower unit on any river? Well, no. Just having water in a river isn't enough. A good dam site must have enough stream flow as well as enough head. A fast-flowing river on the plains is probably not suitable because a dam couldn't be built high enough to provide the head needed for efficient production of electricity. On the other hand, dams in arid high country may have plenty of head but insufficient stream flow. The perfect spot for a hydropower plant is where the right combination of stream flow and head exists. What about the environment? Surely the construction of large dams has an environmental impact. Well, yes it does. Certainly dams and reservoirs are built to improve the lives of people living in towns, farming communities and cities. But there must be a balance between development and preserving the natural environment. Needless to say, the natural river environment is changed, which leads to changes in river ecology and aquatic habitat. Sometimes, for example, dissolved oxygen levels below dams get so low in summer that there is a negative impact on aquatic life. These levels can be improved, however, by using special aerating turbines and or injecting oxygen directly into the stream flow. In order to protect and improve the habitat for endangered and other species of birds, fish and water life, there needs to be a thorough review of operating plans to see if a better balance can be achieved. Hydropower plant design and operation must not only meet the needs of consumers for electricity, but work hand in hand with agencies whose concern is for the fish and wildlife. And water supply. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Hello there, future ILTS champions. Welcome to your journey of mastering the ILTS reading test. This is a crucial step in achieving your dreams, whether they involve studying at a prestigious university abroad or landing that dream job in an international company. The ILTS reading test can seem like a daunting mountain to climb. It's natural to feel overwhelmed by the sheer volume of texts and the variety of questions you'll face. But fear not, my friends. With the right tools and strategies, you can scale this peak and claim your victory. Just like a seasoned mountaineer, you need preparation, practice, and perseverance. This test is designed to assess your reading comprehension skills. You'll encounter a range of texts, from academic articles to everyday materials like advertisements and instructions. It tests your ability to understand different types of texts and answer questions accurately. You'll need to identify main ideas, understand details, infer meanings, and recognize the writer's purpose and tone. One effective strategy is to practice skimming and scanning. Skimming helps you get the gist of the text quickly, while scanning allows you to locate specific information efficiently. Another tip is to familiarize yourself with the different question types, such as multiple choice, true slash false slash not given, and matching headings. Each type requires a different approach, so practice is key. 
Whether you're dreaming of studying abroad or pursuing global career opportunities, a good ILT score can unlock doors. It can be your ticket to a world of possibilities and new adventures. Make use of available resources like practice tests, online tutorials, and study groups. These can provide valuable insights and help you identify areas where you need improvement. So, let's dive in and equip you with the skills you need to succeed. Remember, every great achievement starts with a single step. Take that step today and commit to your preparation. Plan your study schedule wisely, balancing practice with rest. Consistency is key, and regular practice will build your confidence and competence. Get ready to conquer the ILTS, reading challenge with confidence and flair. Your hard work and dedication will pay off, and soon you'll be celebrating your success. Let's embark on this journey together and make your dreams a reality. First things first, let's understand the two versions of the ILTS reading test, academic and general training. These two versions cater to different needs and purposes, so it's crucial to know which one aligns with your goals. The academic test is designed for those aiming for higher education or professional registration. If you're planning to attend a university or work in a professional field, this is the test for you. The texts in this version are more complex and are taken from academic sources. It features extracts from books, journals, and newspapers. These texts are often dense and require a good understanding of academic language and concepts. You'll encounter a variety of question types that test your ability to comprehend and analyze these texts. On the other hand, the general training test is for those migrating to an English-speaking country or seeking vocational training. This version is more practical and focuses on everyday English. It includes texts you might encounter in everyday life like advertisements, notices, and work-related documents. These texts are generally easier to understand and are more relevant to daily activities and workplace scenarios. Both versions assess your reading comprehension, but the text types and difficulty levels vary. The academic test is more challenging and requires a higher level of English proficiency while the general training test is more accessible and practical. Make sure you choose the right test based on your goals. Whether you're aiming for academic excellence or preparing for a new life in an English-speaking country, selecting the appropriate test will set you on the right path. Take the time to understand the differences and choose wisely to achieve your objectives. Time is precious in the ELTS reading test, so mastering the art of skimming is crucial. Skimming is like taking a speedboat ride across the surface of the text. Focus on the main ideas and keywords in each paragraph. Look for headings, subheadings, and any words in bold or italics. Don't get bogged down in the details, just try to get a general understanding of what the text is about. This will help you locate information quickly when you need it. Once you've skimmed the text, it's time to put on your detective hat and start scanning. Scanning is like using a magnifying glass to find specific details within the text. Look for keywords related to the question you're trying to answer. Pay attention to dates, names, places, and any numbers. Don't waste time reading every word. Just zero in on the information you need. Practice makes perfect, so try scanning different types of text to hone your skills. Section 5. Time is of the essence effective time management strategies. Time is a precious resource, and managing it effectively can make a significant difference in your performance, especially in high-stakes exams like the ELTS reading test. Time management is key to success in the ELTS reading test. It's not just about reading quickly but also about reading smartly. Organizing your schedule and planning your study sessions can help you make the most of your preparation time. You have 60 minutes to answer 40 questions, so every second counts. This means you need to be both efficient and effective in your approach. Practice with a timer to get a feel for the pace you need to maintain. Before you start, take a moment to look at the overall structure of the test. Familiarize yourself with the different sections and types of questions. This initial overview can help you strategize and allocate your time more effectively. Divide your time wisely, allocating roughly 20 minutes per passage. This includes reading the passage, understanding the questions, and finding the answers. Stick to this time frame to ensure you have enough time for all sections. Don't spend too long on any one question. If you're stuck, move on and come back to it later. This prevents you from wasting valuable time and allows you to answer more questions overall. Remember, you don't need to understand every single word to answer the questions correctly. Focus on identifying and highlighting key information and keywords that are directly related to the questions. Focus on finding the key information and managing your time effectively. 
Regularly check the time to ensure you are on track. Practice these strategies during your preparation to build your confidence and improve your time management skills. Practicing with sample IELTS. Reading tests can help you get used to the format and timing of the actual test. The more you practice, the more comfortable you will become with managing your time under pressure. Discussing time management strategies with peers can also provide new insights and techniques that you might not have considered. Sharing tips and experiences can be incredibly beneficial. Finally, remember to stay calm and composed. Stress can negatively impact your time management and overall performance. Take deep breaths and approach the test with a clear mind. With effective time management strategies, you can navigate the IELTS reading test more efficiently and increase your chances of success. Good luck! Section 6. Multiple Choice Mayhem – Decoding the Options Multiple choice questions can be tricky, but don't let them intimidate you. Read the question carefully and identify the keywords. Then, scan the text for those keywords and try to find the answer in your own words. Carefully consider each option before making your final selection. Eliminate any options that are clearly wrong or not supported by the text. Don't be afraid to change your answer if you find a better one. Section 7. True, False or Not Given – Navigating the Labyrinth of Information True, false, or not given questions can be particularly challenging. Remember, true means the statement agrees with the information in the text. False means the statement contradicts the information in the text. Not given means the information is not mentioned in the text at all. Be careful not to let your own knowledge or opinions influence your answers. Stick to what the text explicitly states. Section 8. Matching Headings – Finding the Perfect Fit Matching headings. Questions require you to match a list of headings to the appropriate paragraphs or sections of the text. Start by skimming the headings to get a general understanding of the topics covered. Then, skim each paragraph or section of the text and try to summarize the main idea in your own words. Look for keywords that match the headings and choose the best fit for each one. Section 9. Sentence Completion. Filling in the gaps. Sentence completion questions. Test your ability to understand grammar and vocabulary in context. Read the sentence carefully and identify the missing word or phrase. Then, scan the text for the relevant information and look for words that fit grammatically and logically into the sentence. Make sure your answer makes sense in the context of the entire sentence and paragraph. Section 10. Summary Completion – Condensing Information Effectively Summary completion questions require you to complete a summary of the text by filling in the blanks. Read the summary carefully and identify the missing information. Then, scan the text for the relevant information and choose words or phrases that accurately reflect the main ideas of the text. Pay attention to word limits and make sure your answers are grammatically correct. Section 11. Conclusion, practice makes perfect. Congratulations, you've reached the summit of our ELTS reading adventure. Remember, the key to success is practice, practice, practice. Familiarize yourself with different question types, time yourself, and analyze your mistakes. The more you practice, the more confident you'll become. So go forth, conquer the ELTS reading test, and achieve your dreams. Good luck, my friends.